Welcome to Sunday. Welcome to JIBC. And thank you for watching our service. If you're watching online, you probably are not attending our service. We'd love to have you attend. We gather each Sunday at 1045 here with the body of Christ. It's great to preach to people and not temp empty chairs as we have for so many months. We're glad for those who come and look forward to the day when all of you will feel comfortable to return back and be a part of our family, part of our church family, part of our body, the body of Christ here in South Jakarta, here at Jakarta International Baptist Church. I do want to take a moment and rejoice in God's provision for our missions program. There are so many men and women that are serving the Lord and would like to serve the Lord and need a little more support to do it. And so we established the Faith Promise for Missions to raise more funds to be able to support more people in the work of the Lord here in Indonesia. The result of that was wonderful. We had uh, many people responded that they wanted to support Faith Promise, and we're thankful to each of you who did. I would like to remind you that here in November, that uh, don't forget to make your monthly commitment that you've promised to the program. We are watching this fund through October, November, and December, and we'll be determining in January how much we will be able to then monthly commit to others that we'd like to support in their work of the Lord. I'd like to read this morning from Psalm 32. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. Psalm 31 is a parallel to Psalm 51, the Psalms of David's confession of sin. And David realizes in this process that when one's heart is clean before God, it's a good thing. He finishes this psalm after confessing his sin, and he says in verse 11, Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, you righteous. Shout for joy, all you upright in heart. Oh, we're going to take some time today to rejoice in the Lord, to shout to the Lord in joy, to praise Him because He is such a forgiving God. We bring Him our sin, He gives us His righteousness. I hope you'll stick around today for the message on Psalm 51, first in a series that I'll be presenting on forgiveness in God's mercy. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for our time today. Thank you for the, the power of the Word of God, the God of the Word who is abundant in mercy, filled with loving kindness. And so we can come to you with confidence, even when we sin, that you will forgive us of our sin and restore us to yourself. May you guide us in these thoughts this day, Lord. Lift our hearts, we pray, together as we lift them to you. In your name, amen. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. God, He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. Our God. Is an awesome God, He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, 
The power and love of our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. Good morning, church. Today we will be reading from Isaiah chapter 34, for 1 to 7. But now, this is what the Lord says. He who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you, I have summed you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. For I am the Lord, your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I give Egypt for your ransom, Kash and Sheba in your stead. Since you are precious and honored in my sight, and because I love you, I will give a man in exchange for you and people in exchange for your life. Do not be afraid, for I am with you. I will bring your children from the east and gather you for, from the west. I will say to the north, give them up, and, and, the, and the, to the south, do not hold them back. Bring my sons from afar, and my daughters from the end of the earth. Anyone who is called by my name, whom I created from my glory, whom I formed and made. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we gather together again this week. Lord, after after for many of us a time of a time of anxiety or hard work. Lord, for for many of us a time of worry or or doubt. Lord, these are just the times we live in. Lord, we thank you for for bringing us through another week. Lord, and we pray that today you will open our hearts and minds to worship. Lord, that you will not only provide comfort, but remind us of who we are, your people in this place. Lord, help us to be your body under Christ's head. Lord, we pray that, that we can be people who fulfill a purpose in your plan. Lord, please forgive us when we do wrong things and show us, Lord, what is right each day. Lord, we pray for our worship today. We pray that you will bless the pastor and the worship leaders. Lord, we pray that you will open our hearts so that we can be ready for the message that you bring us. Lord, please, please guide us and prepare us for the week ahead. Prepare us to be witnesses and witnesses in new, new and different ways. Lord, show us how to be your people. Lead us in the way we should go. Give us faith confidence in the time ahead. In your son's name we pray. Amen. This is my father's my listening ears, all nature sings and round me rings, the music of the spheres. This is my father's world, I rest me in the thought of rocks and trees, of skies and seas, his hand the wonders wrought. My father's word, the birds their carols raise, the morning light, the lily white declares their maker's praise. This is my father's word, he 
shines in all that's fair. In the rustling grass I hear him pass. He speaks to me everywhere. This is my Father's world. Oh, let me ne'er forget that all the wrong seems all so strong. God is the ruler, yet. This is my Father's work. The battle is not done. Jesus, who died, shall be satisfied, and earth and heaven be one. This is my Father's work. The battle is not done. Jesus, who died, shall be satisfied. In 2003, a man by the name of Eric Smallridge was driving his car under the influence of alcohol. In fact, he was twice above the legal limit for driving. That terrible day, he hit the daughter of Rene Napier, and both Megan and her friend Lisa were killed in that terrible accident. As Eric went to court, the judge sentenced him to 22 years prison for drunken manslaughter and killing of these two girls. The mother, Renee, thinking justice had been paid, decided she would go to schools and churches and give speeches on the danger of drunk driving. But while doing this, God impressed upon Renee's heart to show mercy to Eric. Eric didn't deserve her mercy. J Eric got justice for what he had done. Renee began to visit Eric in the prison and to communicate to him that she had forgiven him through the work of Jesus Christ on her behalf. Eric had trouble accepting and believing this, but eventually he believed this, and Eric himself gave his life to follow Jesus Christ. Before long, Renee went back to the judge and asked the judge to commute Eric's sentence to 10 years instead of 22. The judge agreed that in 2012, Eric was released from prison. That wasn't the end, though. Because of Renee's act of mercy toward this, toward this man, he began to go with her to her speeches. And they added a component of forgiveness required for real healing in situations. Today, we're going to look at Psalm 51 and Psalm 32. In these psalms, which were written after David's acknowledgement of his murder and adultery, we find God's theme of reconciliation. David looks at God for who God is. Then he cries out to God for mercy and cleansing. And God, because of whom he was, did forgive and restore David. Now. We understand that sin is the problem. Sin goes back to the Garden of Eden. God created us to have fellowship with him. Sin breaks that relationship. Sin always brings pain and death to relationships, just as it did to Adam and Eve's relationship and to theirs and God's. This is the nature of sin. But when we sin, the Scripture calls us to a place of repentance. I don't know we understand what that looks like. Well, these two psalms address it clearly. And we'll take some time looking at them today. We need to be reconciled to God. We need to be transformed so we don't go back to who we were in our sin. This is part of the reconciliation process. In these three paragraphs of, this, of Psalm 51, we find David recognizing who God is and begging for forgiveness. Then we find him confessing his sin and then going back once again asking for forgiveness. We're going to learn today to depend on God, who he is, and realize we can confess our sin to him. The first 
point we're going to look at today is who God is. The second point is what God does. Next week, we'll answer the question, what did I do? What sin did I commit? And then we'll look at what will God do because of who he is. When we go to God with our sin, what will God do? And finally, what will I do once forgiven? And David addresses all of this in these Psalms. First of all, we want to understand better who God is. Psalm 51, verse 1, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. In this psalm, right at the beginning, David begins establishing who God is. The first thing he says is that God is merciful. Now, I looked up the word mercy, came up with a simple definition. Bear with me. Mercy is compassion or forgiveness shown towards someone whom it is within their power to punish or to harm. As a youngster growing up, there were times I wish my father had given me more mercy instead of justice. Oh, he gave me what I deserved, and there's no question I deserved what I got from him. But I'm certain there were times I asked him for mercy. David was facing the judgment of God. David had no defense against God. There was nothing he could do to change the fact of what he had done, nor of what he deserved. And so David asked God for mercy. Let's look at the scriptures on this subject of mercy. In James chapter 2, 13, James says that mercy triumphs over judgment. What a great truth that is. God's mercy triumphs over judgment. God is holy. God's justice is 100% accurate. But God is also loving. In his love, God does not give us what we deserve, but he shows mercy. We find a wonderful passage on mercy in, in the book of Micah, verse chapter 7. Micah chapter 7, verse 18, 19. Who is a God like you? who pardons sin and forgives the transgression of the remnant of his, inter- of his inheritance. You do not stay angry forever, but delight to show mercy. You will again have compassion on us. You will tread our sins underfoot and hurl all our iniquities into the depths of the sea. It says here that God delights to show mercy. This word delight, is also translated to take pleasure in. What do you take pleasure in? I take pleasure in riding my bicycle on the road almost as fast as I can for as long as I can. I take greater pleasure in riding a motorcycle as fast as I can. (laughs) When we think of things we take pleasure in, we don't think of taking pleasure in showing somebody mercy. Things that we take pleasure in tend to be things that we enjoy. Does God enjoy showing mercy? The scriptures seem to indicate this. Isn't that a wonderful thought? We have a God of holiness and justice who delights. He takes pleasure in showing us mercy. David also says in Psalm 51.1, that God acts according to his steadfast love. God's steadfast love we find described in Lamentations 3 and verse 22. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions or his mercies never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. God's love toward us is called his great love. His mercies never fail. In the Old Testament, New Testament, the two words, compassion and mercy, are very similar. They're used interchangeably and are nearly synonyms. And so we find that God's mercies never fail. His love is called His great love, and because of it we are not consumed In fact, God's love and mercy is new every morning. It is always fresh. 
It is never old. It is never stale. It is never worn out. I'm sure David knew of God's loving kindness and knew of God's mercy. David was a student of Scripture. The entire, the entire writing of Psalm 119 is, is written about the Word of God. So I have no doubt that David had read Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 7. In here it says, The Lord did not set his affection on you and choose you because you were no more numerous than other people or you were the fewest of all people, but it was because the Lord loved you and kept the oath he swore to your ancestors that he brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the land of slavery from the power of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Know therefore that the Lord your God is God. He is the faithful God, keeping his covenant love to a thousand generations of those that love him and keep his commandments. David knew that God was a God of covenant love, that he set his affection on his people. They didn't deserve it. They didn't do something great to get it. This was the mercy of God to the people of Israel. And David had confidence in the love of God. Psalm 51, 1 goes one step further. It says, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies. Not only did David ask God for his mercy, because God was merciful, but now he says that God is abundant in mercy. He is abundant in mercy. I think of Christ's mercy in the New Testament, and I think right away of the woman taken in adultery. The Pharisees, they wanted judgment. They wanted justice. They wanted Jesus to demand that she be, tr- that she be judged according to the law. Instead, Jesus showed her mercy in a beautiful picture of the mercy, the abundant mercy of God that day. In John chapter 3, Jesus shows mercy to one of the men in the highest levels of society. The Pharisee Nicodemus comes to Jesus. And Jesus takes time with Nicodemus that night, showing Nicodemus compassion, showing him mercy, caring for the soul of this man who lived in the highest level of society. But the very next chapter, we find that Jesus didn't just go for the the, the, the rich and famous nose up on top of culture. No, he goes to a woman in Samaria. Samaritans were half-breed Jews. They were looked down on by the pure-breed Jews. The Samaritans were, uh, were, were always prejudiced against And beyond that, here was a woman of the Samaritans who had been married five times and was now living with the man she wasn't married to. And Jesus shows compassion and mercy to her. Oh, my friend, we have a God of mercy. A God who loves to show mercy. In fact, I found in in, uh, the prayer of Zechariah after the birth of John the Baptist, recorded in Luke chapter 1, 76. He's speaking about his son John, but he references Christ. Notice with me. And you, my child, will be a prophet of the Most High. Speaking of Christ. For you will go on before the Lord to prepare the way for him, for Christ, to give his people, the people of Christ, the way of salvation through forgiveness of their sins, And then verse 78, he says, all this is because of the tender mercy of our God. Jesus came because of the tender mercy of God. Oh, my friends, we have a God who is abundant, abundant, abundant in his mercy. Luke 18, 35, we have a blind man calling out to Christ, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And the crowd tried to shush this man. He wouldn't be shushed. 
he cried out louder, Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on me. And he did. And restored the man's sight. And restored the man's sight. Psalm 136, 26 times is a chorus of the everlasting mercy of God. The mercy of God is is the theme of the song of David. It is the wonder of Moses, the sum of revelation, the hope of mankind, and the song of the soul set free. Oh, how we rejoice in the mercy of God. God's mercy is so great to us today. He is filled in His mercy. Let me ask you a question. If you knew God as a God of mercy, of a God full of love, and a God who abounded in mercy, would you hold back from going to Him to ask forgiveness of your sin? You say, yeah, but Pastor, God's forgiven me hundreds of times. I'm sure He's tired of me coming to Him. You think so? If He's the God who is from everlasting to everlasting, His love is from everlasting to everlasting, and His mercies are new every morning, Do you think he gets tired of extending his love and mercy to you? I think not. For this is who God is. God is the God who has mercy according to his loving kindness and according to the multitude of his tender mercies toward us. If David could go to God with his sin against Bathsheba, against Uriah, against the nation, if David could go to God with these sins and expect God to be forgiven, my friend, so can we. So can we. We see, secondly, today, what God does. First, who God is. Secondly, what God does. Here again in Psalm 51, this last part of the verse, he says, Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. I acknowledge my transgression. My sin is always before me. Down in verse 7, purge me with hyssop, I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me hear joy and gladness that the bones you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sins. Blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God. And renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence. Do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. And uphold me by your generous spirit. Fifteen different times. Fifteen different times. David speaks to God. Asking God to remove his sin from himself. And from between him and God. Can God do that? Is God really able to do what David asks? We're going to look at these points that David asked God to do for him. And I want you to to understand that yes, God can do the very things David asked him to do. David cried these things out to God, believing that God could do it. And he still can today. Let's look at these references together. First of all, David says, blot out my sin from me. To blot something out is it means to remove the stain completely. To remove the stain completely. I often bring home stained clothes to my wife, usually from my days when I worked on my car or when I'd go biking in the rain or something, I'd come back, my clothes would be dirty, and she'd just kind of shake her head. Go and put them in a bucket with water and oxy clean. A few days later, hand it to me and say, it's clean. And she'd get all the, she, she'd get all, all the stains out. She would blot out my dirty clothes. Well, David asked God to blot out his transgressions. Now, I'm going to refer to David in this section as the rebel. Because he was. David rebelled against God. Fully. And and it appears he rebelled against God for a period of about nine months. Not long after Nathan came and David confessed to God, the child was born and the child died. So during the, during the time of the child in the womb of Bathsheba, David was a rebel to God. 
And God calls, or David asks God to blot out, to remove his rebel stains, to remove his transgression. His rebellion made him dirty before God. His life before God was dirty, covered with stains, unclean, filthy, dirty. Now, my friends, when we are full of sin, this is an unshakable feeling. It it, it is a, a weight that wears down our very lives. Sin affects our thoughts, it affects our actions, it affects our reactions. Sin affects our relationships. Sin consumes our life and sin even takes away our hope. We feel like we're stuck and we can't get out of it. There's no way around it, no way through it, and hopelessness can even come in. For in sin sin, there's transgressions and there's guilt. Sin causes us to go against God to go against others. Sin causes us to rebel even more. Our way becomes more, even, our path becomes even more crooked. We miss the target of God's goal for our lives and we know it. Sin is all-compassing. Read Romans 3, 11 to 18 and you see the all-encompassing nature of sin. And David says, dear God, blot out my sin from me. He says, secondly, Wash me thoroughly. Not just wash. Wash me thoroughly. He makes an emphasis on this word thoroughly. Wash me thoroughly. Make me completely clean. This is obviously a step above blotting out or a restatement with a little more emphasis. Now, where do you go to get your soul clean? There's only one place. There's not several places. There's only one. God alone can accomplish our purity and our cleansing. Perhaps David had tried some other avenues during this period of time. Perhaps his rebel soul tried another way to get past his sin. But it came up empty. Usually, when we have a sin in our life, we tend to compartmentalize that sin, and we try to isolate ourselves and avoid that sin while we are indulging in another sin over here. This sin might not seem as bad, and so we don't worry about it as much while we isolate ourselves from this one. There's a group, probably worldwide, I know they're strong in the United States, called Alcoholics Anonymous, or AA. I've known several people that went to AA meetings, and many people they helped. A few people came and they said to me, Pastor, I go to AA meetings and and I know I'm not supposed to drink and do drugs, but they're smoking, they're using profanity, and they're hooking up with people for the night. So while they're teaching us to stay away from the drug and alcohol, they're encouraging our profanity and our immorality. It doesn't work. You can't encourage one area of sin while trying to get rid of another area, and perhaps David tried this. Whatever David tried during that nine-month period of time, he didn't go to God, and so he never did find cleansing. No, he says, wash me thoroughly. Only way to deal with sin in our lives, my friend, is to deal with it thoroughly. Ask God to remove it from us thoroughly. Then he says to God in verse 2, cleanse me. Cleanse me from my sin. His plea for forgiveness is intense. It's intense. He's saying, blot out my sin. Wash me thoroughly. Cleanse me of my sin. Seven times David asked for forgiveness one way or another. The beginning and end, he speaks of sins being blotted out and sins being removed. Twice he asked his sins washed away. He also asked God to purify him from his sin and pleads with God to quit taking notice of his sin. He says, God, may you hide your face even from my sin. Stop noticing this and pointing it out to me. Hmm. David was serious, wasn't he? He was going to the source to get the help that only the source could give him. Notice, my friends, David did not look at God and say, Oh, God, I'm sorry. God, I'm sorry. 
Yeah, I, I know I blew it, and I'm sorry. We don't find the words, I'm sorry, in this at all, in fact. The problem with the words, I'm sorry, is we tend to, to say, well, I did that, and they didn't, they didn't accept it. So I did my part. I said I was sorry, and they didn't accept it. So now it's on them. We don't find this attitude in David. There's no one and done attitude in David's apology here. As I mentioned, 15 different ways he communicates to God, pleading with God to forgive him and restore him. David was a broken man. In his brokenness, he pours his heart out to God for cleansing and forgiveness. He says in verse 7, Purge me with hyssop, and I will be clean. Purge me with hyssop, and I will be clean. We find in Numbers chapter 12, hyssop is a branch that was used to wipe the blood on the doorpost. Hyssop was used in sacrifices as an applique for the blood of the lamb. I did a little research on hyssop. You know what the hyssop branch was? It was a bush that grew everywhere. It was common as grass. So David says to God, purge me with hyssop. There was no, there was no pilgrimage he had to make. There was no, no special place he needed to go to, nor special words he had to say. He simply said, purge me with hyssop. He knew that the cleansing of God was available for anybody who would cry out for that cleansing. God's forgiveness was close by the rebel. And the rebel cried out to God's close forgiveness to be forgiven. Again in verse 7, he says, wash me. Wash me. What happens when you sin in rebellion against God? Do you just go and wash yourself? Here, the, it, it's a reflex of God. You wash me. He's not saying, yeah, I, I, I went to church. Yeah, I, I, I said the magic words. Or, yeah, I gave the money. Or, 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 or I, I did what I was supposed to do. Oh, I, I, I was a better husband. I was a better. He didn't say these things. He says, God, can you wash me? I can't cleanse myself from my sin. I need you to wash me. And then he says, God, I'd like to hear joy and gladness again in verse 8. I'd like to hear joy and gladness again. You know what sin does? Sin kills our joy both within and without. It kills our joy both within and without. You ever lost your song? Has sin ever taken your ability to sing? Praise to God away. It's not a good place to be, is it? David said, I've lost my song. The psalmist of Israel didn't have the song of praise in his lips because of the sin in his heart. And he says, God, let me hear joy and gladness again. Then he says also in verse 8, let the bones which you have broken be healed. Let the bones that you have broken be healed. Now, God didn't break David's bone, the bones of his body, but the word broken here isn't sufficient. Broken can be just a clean break. I had children, and so we had broken bones in our family. A broken bone can be a clean break that can be put back together and splinted, and it can heal. But the word here is the word for crushed, broken into pieces. He says, my bones, a passive verb, my bones have been crushed because of my sin. Now, a broken bone is painful, but a crushed bone is worse. A broken bone can be healed pretty easily, a crushed bone not so well. And David uses this word here. The rebel knows that God is against him. His life has been crushed under his sin. 
And my friends, sin is never without consequences of pain and brokenness. Never. There are no little sins. Sin always brings pain and always will bring brokenness, a feeling of being crushed by it or crushed under it. This began with Adam and Eve in the garden. They sinned against God and they hid. They made themselves coats from leaves and hid from God. They didn't belong in God's presence. They were crushed by their sin. It brought them pain. Their sin caused a continuing crushing because before long, their their first son murdered their second son. And no doubt Adam and Eve looked at themselves and said, if only we hadn't taken that fruit. If only we hadn't sinned against God, because sin always brings pain. The scripture says, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever you plant, that you will also reap. When we plant sin, we receive the consequences of that sin. It doesn't change. You plant corn, you get corn. You plant rice, you get rice. You plant sin, you get pain. You get death. You get the crushing pain of that sin. David says, let these bones you have crushed be healed. Then he says in verse 9, to hide your face from my sin. Hide your face from it. Stop looking at it. Is there a way way for me to stop being seen and discovered in my sin? Just as Adam and Eve tried to cover their sin, so David feels His sin always upon him. Now, I'm going to take this a step beyond what the Scripture teaches here in this spot because there's a New Testament parallel, and that's called justification. For what David was really asking for God to hide from the sin was that it might be removed from God's sight, and God removes our sin through the judicial act of justification, the act where Christ takes our sin upon himself He pays for it through his suffering and death on the cross. And God the Father in turn gives us freely the righteousness of Jesus Christ. He makes us holy with Christ's righteousness, thereby legally justifying us forever. Oh, God can take your sin this day and remove it from you and from him forever through the justifying work of Jesus Christ. Hide yourself from my sin. And then in verse 9, he says, now he says, blot out all my iniquities. David knows there's more than just the sins he committed against Bathsheba and Uriah. David knows there's sin in his life. It's on the table. And here he says, blot out all my iniquities. Makes me think of the second part of verse John 1, 9. If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. My friends, when we go brokenhearted before God, we go with a contrite spirit before God, we go pleading before God with our sin, asking him to forgive us. Not only does he forgive us of the sin we're asking, he goes beyond and cleanses us of all unrighteousness. Oh, what a wonderful, forgiving God we have. He is abundant in mercy, is he not? And then David says in verse 10, Create in me a clean heart, O God. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Creation is an act of God. Creation is a miracle of God. When we are born again, God gives us a new heart. He puts a new spirit within us. Creation is no small thing. Jesus took the five loaves and two fish of a boy and feeds 5,000 people with fish and bread that were never in the sea and were never in the fields. He tells a man with a withered arm to reach forth his hand. And, and, And Jesus, on the spot, creates blood vessels, nerves, muscles, bone, skin, perhaps even fingers and fingernails, as the man reaches out his hand and Jesus performs a miracle of creation. David says to God, create in me a clean heart. It was. 
It's not now. Can I get it back? My heart had become vile and dark, the rebel said. My heart had turned against you. I want a new heart, a regenerated heart that's in line with you. We can't do this on our own. This is a, the, the work of God, the creative work of God. We read in the scripture today from Isaiah 43, 1 through 7, and we see the wonderful mercy of God at work on, the, on, the heart, on that behalf of his people. God creates us for his glory so he can show us his love and his grace. He receives us. He creates within us a new heart. And we are accepted by him because of his mercy and his creative work. This is something David cannot do for himself. David cannot change his heart. The rebel can't make his heart new. So he cries out to the one who can. So it is David's responsibility here to plead with God for these changes. But only God has the power to effect the change. And God changes those who come to him his way. In humility and brokenness. David says, renew a right spirit within me. Or as one says, renew a steadfast spirit within me. In Psalm 57, and verse 7, My heart is steadfast, O God, my heart is steadfast. I will sing and give praise. But because of his sin, David had lost the steadfastness of his heart. And he asked God to return. Renew a steadfast spirit within me. And then he says in verse 11, Cast not away. Cast me not away from your presence. David was aware of what happened to King Saul. The Spirit of God left Saul because of Saul's rebellion to God. And perhaps David had this in mind when he says, Dear God, please don't cast away your presence from me. In the same verse he says, Do not take your Holy Spirit from me. King Saul lost the presence of God. He lost the spirit of God. And David says, please, don't remove this from me. The rebel no longer enjoyed the holiness of God. He no longer enjoyed the holy presence of God's Holy Spirit within. He had pushed that holiness away through his sin. And now he says, Lord, don't take this from me. In a spiritual moment, the rebel begs God to return his holiness to him. He pleads with God to return his presence to him. And then he says in verse 12, restore to me the joy of your salvation. I'm going to change it a little bit. Restore to me the joy of your deliverance. David knew the deliverance of God. God had delivered him from Goliath. God delivered him from the enemies. God delivered him from Saul. God delivered David every time he went out. But not this time. Because David went out in sin. And he had no joy of God's deliverance in his life anymore. And says, God, please restore to me the joy of of your deliverance. The rebel knew what it was like to rejoice in God's salvation, in God's deliverance, but he also knew it was gone. At one time, David danced in the streets, praising God, exuding praise to God for bringing the ark of the ark back to Jerusalem. But he'd lost this place of rejoicing, and he asked God to bring it back. And then the last one we'll see here in verse 12, he says, God, uphold me with a willing spirit. Interesting word, huh? Restore, uphold me with a willing spirit. Grant me, God, a willing spirit to sustain me. Grant me, God, a willing spirit from you to sustain me. Sin had not sustained David. Remember when Nathan the prophet came and told the parable of the rich man 
who took a sheep from the poor man. David says to, says to Nathan, why, and that rich man, he did a terrible thing. He should restore fourfold to the poor man the sheep he stole. And Nathan points his finger at David and said, David, you're that man. You stole the one precious sheep of Uriah when you had others that belonged to you. And David, in his cold heart, unsustained by God, he was harsh. He was un, unjust. He was unmerciful. And now he knows it. And he says, God, I need you to, to sustain me again with your spirit. I need you to support me. To firm up my life. David lost God's sustaining support. He'd lost his unflinching and his firm mind. Now he wanted it back. And so he went to God, the only place to go. My friend, from these 15 actions, we come to understand that the rebel David, the rebel psalmist, was coming back to God. And he expected God to fully restore him completely. He expected God full forgiveness and full, full restoration. Now, as we wrap this up here, I want to ask you a question. Can forgiveness ever be partial? Can restoration ever be partial? Can, what if God had only partially forgiven and partially restored David? Would he have been forgiven and restored? Well, no, he wouldn't have. I must be honest. Husbands, wives, you have a difficulty. One of you says you're sorry. The other says, I'll think about it. Do you feel forgiven? Do you feel restored? One says, I'm sorry. Others say, well, well I, I, I'll accept your apology for this, but not for that. Do you feel forgiven? Do you feel restored? Is your relationship where it should be? Of course not. David knew he could go to God for full forgiveness and for full restoration. And my friends, we go to God on the same basis. John 1.29 Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Suppose Jesus only took half of your sin away. Suppose he took 90% of your sin away, but left 10% with you. Wouldn't work, would it? When it comes to forgiveness and restoration, it is an all or nothing equation. Jesus defeated sin and he defeated death. These weren't partial defeats. These were complete defeats. We have confidence in our Savior because of this. Therefore, we can go to God and truly expect that He is, he is both able and willing to forgive us when we come to Him with humility and brokenness. A broken and contrite heart, O oh God, you will not despise. We see today who God is. God is merciful. He is filled with loving kindness. And he has a multitude of tender mercies. That's who God is. What does God do? Thankfully, he fully forgives. He makes us clean. And restores us completely in fellowship to himself. You might struggle with thinking David deserved to be restored, but that wasn't the point. Whether he deserved it wasn't even on the table. David knew he didn't deserve it. It wasn't a matter of what he deserved. He went to God because of God's mercy. Therefore, God did not give David what he deserved. Oh, there were consequences in David's family, but David and God were restored. And restored fully. My friend, is there a sin keeping you from God today? Is there a sin that you feel is just too bad and that God probably can't forgive you for? Is there a situation that you won't deal with because you just feel it's too big? It's too harsh. It's too dirty. It's too rebellious. And so you've not taken it to God. 
I hope you realize today that you can. The God who forgave David is the same God that you and I go to today. And we go to him because he is able and willing to forgive and to forgive whatever we bring before him. It doesn't matter how many times we've come to him. His mercies are new every morning. His faithfulness to us is great. And his loving kindness is from everlasting to everlasting. Let's pray together. We want to thank you, Lord, today that you are a God of of abundant love and mercy. We thank you that when we come to you, we know this about you. And we can come with confidence and boldness before you. Father, whether we have sinned as David has or sinned in some other way, You call us to bring our sin to you and to find forgiveness and restoration with you. Lord, I pray that this day, this week, men, women, and young people would give their sin to you because you are able to take it from them. It might bring their rebel hearts to the cross of Christ and find the blood of Christ able and sufficient to remove all of that sin from them. Lord, you can and you will when we come to you humbly and broken before you. We thank you, Lord, that you are the forgiving God. We thank you we can be at peace with you, that you can restore both the purity of our hearts by creating a new heart within us. You can restore the joy of our deliverance. You can restore the song of the Savior to our lives. And so we come today, Lord, rejoicing in you for this. In Jesus' name, amen.
and shall be delighted.